Okay, we're rolling. Okay, this is an interview at the Holiday Inn, Kingston, New York. It is the 6th of October, 2006, approximately 3 p.m. Interviewers are Mike Russert and Wayne Clark. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? Okay, my name is John William Finn, and I was born on July the 24th, 1909, in the city of Los Angeles. All right. Um, when did you uh, enter the Navy? I got in the Navy. After, uh, I had to finish grammar school, and I got kicked out of grammar school in the eighth grade. So I went to work for three years, and when I became 17 years old, I enlisted in the Navy as an apprentice seaman in July. 1926, but I was born in 1909. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, where did you enter the Navy? Where, where did you enter? Where oh, did you? I entered, actually, I entered in the city of Los Angeles. Los Angeles, okay. That was the recruiting station for mm -hmm. And when did you, were you discharged? I got discharged from active service in 1947. Okay. March 1947. Um, after you went to through basic training, what kind of ship were you assigned to? Well, that was a sad point in my life. I went through basic training and then I was selected to go in what they called the guard company. And the guard company was three additional months at the Naval Training Station in San Diego. Then started a long tour of duty. I did not get to go to sea. I had been there four years in the Navy before I got assigned to a ship. And mm -hmm. as time goes on, I remember before I got to be a Apprentice seaman when you enlisted, $21 a month, and seaman second when you were at four months in the Navy, and then you could, the best that you could advance was 10 months in the Navy to be a seaman first class. Mm -hmm. But I was like a lot of other guys, and it took a lot of time sometimes to go and make seaman first. And my, Duty took me to the Naval Air Station in San Diego, California, early in 27, because I'd gone to a special school in Great Lakes, Illinois. I got there December 26 and went through training. Then, after you finished that training, I ordered to San Diego Naval Air Station on North Island. And was there all the rest of 1927. Now, what did you do while you were there? I uh, was there. They found and determined to make me a rigger or an aviation machinist mate. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to be a gunner's mate in the Navy. And I then, after I was there a while, I learned that there was a rating called aviation. It was only like 300 a minute. And that was the gunner's mates of aviation, mm -hmm. aviation ordnance. All the stuff that killed people happened to be what I, I love guns. And, and as soon as I could get in this aviation ordnance thing, in those days, basically, the first thing you learned was machine guns. Mm -hmm. and I was really interested in those. First rifle, pistols, machine guns, and then later on, other kind of guns. Mm -hmm. so, but it did take me quite a while to get out of the making airplane parts to be in the gunner, the aviation ordnance run is what they call it. Mm -hmm. but nobody, the, the, you hardly knew that it was there because they just abolished, they established the rate in May of 1926, a few months before I got in. Aviation ordnance rating. Once I got to the air station, 
took me quite a while to get out of the, make an airplane parts, you know. Mm -hmm. But there was wood, wire, and fabric. And they put me in what they called the assembly and repair shops, the wing shop of the assembly and repair division, making airplane parts. And mostly the small stuff to <coughs> start fuselages. They were made out of fabric, mm -hmm. and the wings were all covered, they were made wooden wings covered with fabric, and then your elevators, and ailerons, and rudders, and horizontal and vertical stabilizers. That was all part of the mm -hmm. plane. Mm -hmm. And that's what we did there. I was doing that for several months. When I finally was able to get transferred to the Aviation Ordnance Department at North Island, mm -hmm. immediately I got there, went to work. The big old first class gunner's mate, Anthony Costigli. He was my first boss. And it was very shortly after that, Michael Joseph Kilrain, he was now um, one of the men that had changed his radio would say torpedo man or gunner's mate to aviation ordnance. Then the next boss, ex boatswain's mate, Miles Kingsley Ager. He was my next boss and I worked for him quite a while. Then transferred down to a battery of three inch 50 caliber anti aircraft guns on the, that were located on the southwest wall the southwest end of North Island. And half of North Island in those days was an army base, Rockwell Field, big air, air base there, as well as an aircraft. And that's where I did my first almost three years in the Navy. And then I was transferred to the USS Lexington, one of the big battle cruisers and converted to an aircraft carrier, Lexington, and Saratoga both. And I didn't get on the Saratoga until I put the USS Houston in commission in 1930. Now I'm on a real fighting heavy cruiser, eight inch gun cruiser for the USS Houston. And they put seven of them. Commission to Salt Lake City and the Pensacola. They were in put in commission in 1929. And then they started the other four cruisers, USS Houston, which I was attached to, then the USS Northampton, the USS Augusta, and the USS Chester. And the Houston right away went to China and became the flagship of their Asiatic fleet. An Asiatic fleet in those days was quite a little, an awful lot of destroyers and submarines. And of course they had a old USS Pecos, it was our big boiler out there. Then the next biggest ship was an ex coal collier called the USS Jason, coal burning ship. And a big ship, it was almost 600 feet long, and about now was the end of the coal burning Navy. Mm -hmm. How did it feel to be out to sea finally? So it was what? How did it feel to be out to sea finally? Oh, God, I was a happy sailor. I mean, it, it hurt my feelings that I, that I was damn near three, over three years ashore. Mm -hmm. And I was always busy with it. But when I got on the Houston and put her out in commission and went to China, then I was now a member of the Asiatic fleet and composed of quite a few of the old four stack destroyers and a lot of submarines and very few airplanes. The Jason, a big huge coal collier, had been converted into our first aircraft tender. She was no longer coal collier, but mm -hmm. she was complete coal collier configuration. Had five huge A-frames, and the coal holes were just huge 
empty coal hole, no coal in them, because they quit. Mm -hmm. In other words, there's so very few air, uh, coal burning ships left. The coal, the Houston, it was an oil burner, and the Jason was a coal burning ship herself. And could, was the last one. There were very few coal burning ships. We, we had a few here and there, mainly in the Philippines, and out in Samoa, one or two. Hawaiian Islands, and quite a few were down in Cuba and in the Virgin Islands, which we had, that was one of the Virgin Islands we had purchased uh -huh. from Denmark. And when I got there, most of the citizens of the Virgin Islands weren't very happy with the United States because part of it became United States citizens all there, what they got was prohibition. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was, if you wanted, like when I was first at San Diego, if you wanted to drink beer, you had to get to Tijuana across the border. But of course, in China, we had everything mm -hmm. in the world. When I, when I was there for mm -hmm. over one year, because I had to get to Houston and commission. Mm -hmm. Then we went on to a shakedown cruise to Europe and up and down the East Coast and in and out of the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Found out that you could house, house the top masts on a cruiser. I didn't know that until I was on it. Stand by to house top masts so we would go under the Brooklyn Bridge yeah. and get in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Now what rank were you at that point? Oh, uh, not rank, I was a rate. Rate, rank okay. Rank is an officer. I was a rating, and my rating was now this aviation ordinance. And there were damn few, I think, I think they were wrong. When they established the rating, I think they authorized 25 or 30. I'm not, mm -hmm. I never was able to find out how many. And I knew an awful lot of them, mm -hmm. guys, because they had a few on the East Coast. and. I knew, I knew of practically every one of the aviation ordinance money after they established the rate. And I was the 34th aviation ordinance. I was one of the young kids who made the rating later. Mm -hmm. The other petty officer, I knew a lot of those old, they were old senior petty officers, most of them. At 10, 12, 14 years, and a couple of them, old chiefs, they were at just about 20 years service. And they shortly went out of when they got their 20. Used to be the sailor, generally did 20 years. And then he transferred to the Fleet Naval Reserve for the remainder of time to make 30 years service. Mm -hmm. He did not retire in 20 years. I, I know I thought I was retired after it took me a little while to realize, hey, I'm still in the Fleet Naval Reserve, mm -hmm. and if they wanted you for any reason, didn't want me to when Korea come along. <laughs> I was now out of the Navy inactive service. Now, um, you were at Pearl Harbor when it was attacked? Yes. Can you tell us about that? Well, it was a great day in the morning, but actually it was very simple to say. <laughs> the Japanese come early in the morning, rudely awakened us and kicked the hell out of us and left. And they, everybody mostly understands that the Japanese had quite a task force come over there. You heard about the six aircraft carrier, mm -hmm. but they also had tankers. They had, a, I th I'm not sure whether they had a battleship or so, but they had heavy cruisers mm -hmm. and light cruisers, and I suppose a few destroyers. And they had a lot of Hawaiian, around the Hawaiian area, and all around the Philippine Islands, and all over mm -hmm. the Dutch possessions out there. Mm -hmm. Now, where were you when the attack took place? Actually, I had been, well, it started up in Alaska. I was 
in Alaska squadron up there. We came down from Alaska, operated on Lake Washington, which is a huge lake right near Seattle. And I was now in one of the PBY-5 squadrons. Before that, there were four runners of the PBY planes. They were made over in Beth Page, Long Island, mm -hmm. New York. Then that factory moved down there. And by 1938, we now, those squadrons out there in the Philippines, and mainly in Hawaii, we had squadrons of PBY patrol planes. And there were 12 of those patrol planes in each of three squadrons, VP-11, VP-12, and VP-14. Each squadron based at Kaneohe Bay had 12 PBY-5 airplanes, the latest model modification of Japanese. And by now, I had almost 15 years service and I'd been a chief petty officer, an aviation chief ordnance man with my rating mm -hmm. at that time. And when the Japs come early, and it's now known, it was known then, that the Japs hit our base, Kaneohe Bay. It means Kani is a man, oh, he is supposed to have been skinny or something. Mm -hmm. Skinny Man Bay is the Hawaiian name for it, Kaneohe Bay. And I was based there, but I was, in those days, they generally had one aviation chief ordnance. And I had around 35 men in my ordnance crew, composed of all the way from seamen strikers, and third, first, second, first class strikers. I even had a couple of young chiefs in my mm -hmm. just but I was the senior chief ordinanceman in my squadron. And I said the Japs come real early in the morning. And of course, I lived in quarters on the base. And by the time, the, well, it was a strange thing. And all of this stuff that you learn in the Navy career, I was familiar with it. All this stuff that suddenly here early in the morning, it's Sunday morning. And I heard airplanes fly. Well, they were not PBYs. They were single engine planes. There were Japanese Zeros and a lot of dive bombers, horizontal bombers. And the first thing that hit me, hey, it's Sunday. Who the hell is flying over the quarters and not flying on the flight pattern? Mm -hmm. You know, any aircraft. Mm -hmm. You've got to have a very strictly controlled flight pattern. And they weren't doing that. They were flying over our quarters. I lived in quarters on the base. And they were single engine planes. Hey, it's Sunday. Hey, who the hell is flying planes? Who's firing machine guns? Why are the machine guns firing so slow? All this comes just. Just like that, a few seconds, and all flew through my head. And now here's what happened. About that time, I heard a real rapid firing on my brand new quarters. We just these were brand new quarters. And I and my wife had got the, these quarters, you know, you rented them from the Navy. And I heard this rapid firing. I mean, rapid knocking on my front door. It was Sunday morning, and everybody laid around there, you know, it was Sunday morning, holiday routine. I didn't have the duty or anything. I was just fixing to, I never was a guy to lay in bed. So all of the things that come through, and then I rushed down, I heard this rapid knocking. I was in two-story quarters. Right downstairs, opened the door. Uh, oh, I, I, I didn't have any clothes on either. I just pulled on my dungaree pants and got sanitary and opened the door. And here stood a girl named Lou Sullivan. She was the wife of one of the young chiefs that had just made chief petty officer in my ordinance gang. Uh -huh. And I said, Lou, what the hell is up? 
She said they want to go in the hangar. Right? Okay, wait. And I asked you this question. What's mm -hmm. up? She turned and run like a deer, just like that. So I knew now I begin to have a funny feeling in my gut. All these strange things, unusual things, not strange, uh -huh. that were happening. I got, went up, turned right upstairs, put on my shirt, jumped on, I was now a chief petty officer, and I'd been a chief for six years. And I told my wife, I'm on the way to the hangars. My car was parked right out behind my quarters in a little parking lot. I jumped in my car <laughs> and, oh, her husband came out of his quarters. He just made chief and he was quite a smoker and he had quite a little beer belly on him. <laughs> and so I got, I got right in my car and everything slowed down because the station speed limit was 20 miles an hour. So I backed out of my car, parked out of my parking place, Eddie Sullivan, her husband got in my car, didn't even say anything. I guess we were both wondering what the hell was up. I drove out of the parking lot, went on to the main road, and there's a hill there called Hawaiiloa Hill. It looks almost like a volcanic crater. What it was, was I don't know. But it was a reasonable little hill, and I started the road, went right around that hill, and when you got around halfway around, that road straightened out and went right straight down to the waterfront, which was the place where all these big PBY airplanes were launched. They got launching ramps there. And it takes a beach crew and a tractor and everything to launch each and every plane. And when I got there, just as I got part way around the hill, there was a boy walking around, going to a young sailor, going to the going to the home. Going to the hangar? Yes. Jumped in the back of my car. Now, I got halfway around there and I heard a horrible black of the stern. One of the jet planes was making a scraping run. And just as he got alongside of me, kept his wing up, and I saw those old red meatballs on the bottom of his ring. And I'd been out in China in 31, 32, and it observed how the Japs done out there. They didn't give a damn for anybody. They didn't care. And we're going to have to stop. Can um, we continue this brain. later? <laughs> you can go ahead and continue. All right. Uh, in this case, as I said before, when I got onto the road that went around the base of this Hawaii lower hill, and at that time, it was just nothing but a hill. Today, it's got more uh, security and stuff like that tied up, with it. I understand it, underneath the hill and on top of it, and all kinds of what you call security stuff. But in those days, as I went around that hill, I picked up this young lad that was walking towards the hangar. That's he was Came and ride in the back of my car and run around there. And right at that time, I think I told you about it. I heard a real loud noise behind me. It was an approaching, strafing plane coming mm -hmm. from a stern of me. And as he got alongside of me, he made kind of what you call a wing over. He lifted one wing up. It was right down on top of the buildings, right along in there, there were several two-story buildings. And when he put a wing down that way, I saw those red beat balls. And you see pictures of the Japanese planes had real bright red, what we, we just called them the meat ball, the round mm -hmm. red ball. That was a, sign of a Japanese plane. And these looked like they were the dingiest looking red I ever saw. It almost looked like the red ball had been mixed with mud. They were not bright red and pretty. I mean, pretty color. Anyway, they made the swing over and then went on down towards the hangar from, from that position. 
And when I saw the red on those wings, I can still remember Eddie Sullivan was sitting in the hangar and he just still was buttoning up his shirt. And he had an unlit cigarette in the corner of his mouth. And when I said, this is the real McCoy, Eddie of the Japs, he said, shook his head. <laughs> and it was actually comical. That old cigarette, unlit cigarette was banging up and shaking up and down of his mouth. Didn't say any word. He just agreed with me by a shake of his head. And I put my car in second gear, threw it up in second gear, and I really wound on down. I forgot all about the station speed limit. And those V8 Ford would really wind. And I got down to the end of this straight road right when I got around the first bend. The road went right straight down towards the first hangar in line and the boat dock was down there. And when I got down to the end of that road, I was going like it's called the tail dape, and I had to throw on my brakes and go down around the corner that led straight down inboard of the three hangars that were built along the edge of the beach. Now these are great big hangars and there was quite a space, maybe 25 yards between each of the hangars. And when I got around there, I started to accelerate down to the end of that road. When I remembered I had this young lad, and I just yelled over my shoulder, what squadron? And he said, right here. <laughs> he got off, and I skidded to a stop there. He opened the door and got out and he just stood. I looked up in the rear view wire and he was just standing in the middle of the street because his hangar had just started on the bay side, just started to burn. There were wooden buildings that had been built onto the hangars after they were constructed. Mm -hmm. There were offices along there and they were wooden structures just built against the side of the hangar. And they had already started to smolder and right on the straight of the street. There were parking areas at, at each hangar and there were cars parked in there. I didn't see anybody in them, but the, you could see the upholstery was, had been on fire and smoke was just beginning to come up out of the upholstery. By then, I got rid of his passenger and put my car in gear and I stomped on it and run it clear down to the end of that road where it actually ended in a place where there were, there were dredgers all around Conway Bay, mm -hmm. dredgers working all the time, dredging the bay out where it had to be drained and deposited that drainage, building up the air base, which they were doing right around there, and that was going on right then. And I went right to the regular parking area, just out of force of habit, went in there and threw on my emergency brake and kicked my car out of the gear and put it on and jumped out of it before it even started, and I had about a 125 yard dash now to get out of that parking area and across a little intervening in step where there was a rope and these hangars were new and there was dirt, just earth around the area where the hangar had been built. And I had to run across that hangar, it was a big hangar. And I run all the way from my car across that my armory. The armory is where guns and things are kept. All the guns, ammunition, and tools, and where my crew would meet every morning. We'd muster. And the main thing it wasn't the formal muster. Look around, find out who was there and who wasn't there, and generally have a little discussion, maybe a 
were showing some. Oh, he had the mid watch that night. He could sleep in for a couple of hours, authorized. The guy with the mid watch sleep in was maybe till seven o'clock. Then we'll get his chow, what they call late chow, mm -hmm. a mess hall. When I run across that hangar, this is the first thing that hit me. We had been going on these anti-sub patrols. And that time, to get an airplane ready to go on a sub patrol, you put bombs and dip charges on it. And you had to have the dip charges in the hangar to get them on the plane in order for it to take off. It took a little while to load them and get the plane ready, and the plane crew had to get there. And generally, they were there. But that depth charges, I think there were four depth charge handling cars right there in the corner of the armory, right inside the hangar. Thing. And instinctively, I knew those things shouldn't be there. <laughs> because there are 500 pounds of TNT in each dip charge, and right off the bat, I thought possibly a stripping plane, the bullets might go in there and set off those dip charges. Mm -hmm. the, oh, the dip charges was not something that the Navy aviation used all the time. The dip charges were normally rolled up the rear end of a destroyer, destroyer at sea, and they would sink to a certain, a fuse was set, depth fuse, say it's set for 25, 30, or 40 feet. When the depth charge reached that depth, the depth fuse went off and detonated that 500 pound charge of TNT under the water that was depth charge submarines and anything under the water that you wanted to. And so anyway, I immediately thought about those depth charges. The minute I heard guns shine my army door, there was a doorway out of the armory onto the ramp where the planes were all parked around those three hangars. Patrol plane is a big airplane. They were parked more or less at random around the hangar wherever the beach crew would haul them up. Mm -hmm. Big, heavy plane. And anyway, those dip charges, they hit me right then. Get them out of here. But in the meantime, I heard guns flying outside, and that's where I began to, we'll say, fight back to the Japs. They were already there and they had already made a right or two up or down the ramp. But our hangar and the other hangar near just were not burning. Mm -hmm. And when I run out of that armory, there was a young lad firing a 30 caliber gun. He was a radioman, Robert J. Peterson, and manning a 50 caliber gun on the, just a little short distance away was one of my men. He was a big Indian boy from Oklahoma, Lucky Walters. He was already manning a 50 caliber machine gun, and the other guy was manning a 30 caliber machine gun. So I yelled at the mechanic, I mean the radio man was manning the 30 caliber. The first thing I said was, move your gun out. You're going to shoot the top of Bucky's head off. He was firing right over the head of this guy, big tall guy. <laughs> Indian boy was a big lad. And this other guy, little short blonde haired, big eyed kid, he had eyes about that big around. And I yelled at him to move his gun out. He's going to shoot the top of Bucky's head off. He wasn't careful. And he said, can't, Chief, we can't, they're just shooting at us. <laughs> so anyway, I grabbed that gun, that he, and a 30 caliber gun, 
any man that had any strength at all could pick the whole mount, the machine gun, and the ammunition was in it and move it. One man could do that. Well, I moved it on out about, oh, maybe 20 yards or so, so that I could see up over the top of these hangars or great huge buildings. And my eyes weren't good enough to see through them. <laughs> so they moved it out there, and then I started firing at the strafing. When that guy Peterson said, told me, he said, we can't move the gun, Chief. The Japanese were shooting at him. And sure enough, I looked out over the bay, and there was a Japanese zero plane making a big open curve, and he was getting ready to come down right and shoot parallel to the hangar at those men, men and the machine guns. Mm -hmm. Now, the other hangars, were, they, they were out of my, you can't see everything. And there was plenty going around at our own hangar to not even think about what was hanging down there. There was other three big, I'd already passed two big hangars to get to the one that my squadron occupied and used as its hangar. That was VP-14 squadron. Did you have any idea how many planes there were? The attacking planes? Yeah. Well, no. You didn't really know because they, it was not a steady attack by planes. These Japanese planes had to come around, get lined up on the target, and start firing. That's what they were doing. But I could see, in this case here, I could see several jet planes most of the time. Once in a while, you'd go out there to start firing, you couldn't see a jet plane. They were hidden, making a circle, an approach, or something like that. But before that two and a half hours was over, there was lots of times you could see jet planes, and they were scraping. And the main thing that they were doing was Strafing these, these planes of ours and our squadron and on down to the other hangars where the other squadrons had planes there. And they continued that attack all during that two and a half, the attack lasted about two and a half hours. So they got down there known fact that they attacked at Kaneohe Bay before they did Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. I don't know who determined that, but it was well known that they attacked Kaneohe Bay first because they didn't have a big problem getting lined up with the targets. They could just come swooping down there. And their target was the hangars and mainly the airplanes. Mm -hmm. Things like that. And it wasn't very long before they, the old the Japanese had incendiary ammunition. I've been a chief ordinance now for six years. I knew and read about incendiary ammunition, but we didn't have any there. If we had them, I'd never seen them. We, didn't. we had armor piercing ammunition. All ammunition, which is just a plain bullet, and tracer ammunition. And that's a bullet that goes through the air. They had, oh, they had over the years different colored tracer. Some was red. I think most of the in there was a kind of a bright red. And they also had bright, light green, and a white tracer. Those were three kinds of tracers that I saw. We had, we had no incendiary ammunition, and incendiary ammunition is a damn efficient thing to start fires. If it hits something, it'll burn. That thing's on fire. And had lots of that ammunition, and that's basically what does more damage than anything else at Conneoy Bay. It took those planes all on fire. You see, in each plane 
had over 2,000 gallons of aviation gas in the plane, in the tanks. Because the minute the plane in the Navy finished its flight, one of the first things that happened to it after they got it secured on, on the ground and wasn't it was longer flying in the air, came with the gas truck and gassed it up. And on big air stations, they didn't even have gas stations. There were so often, there'd be a gas pit on the ground and enough hose on those nozzles to take them right up on top of the wings. PBYs were a great huge plane. They flew mm -hmm. up in the air, I guess around 20 feet. And the crew and the gas, they climb up on top of the wings Cast people pass nozzle up to them, and then they would top up all the tanks. And they had also a lot of big gas tanks inside the hull of a PPY. So all of those planes out there, every one of them, had all that gas in them. Mm -hmm. When the Japanese come up there and send red bullets, bullets couldn't. Uh, especially if they got into the center section of the wing or shot through the hull, this thin aluminum Durrell. And the Japanese bullets would go right through there. That was what done all the damage there after two and a half hours. They had burned up, set on fire every plane we had on the base. And we had not only PBYs, we had a few, uh, what they, well, they had old JRFs. They were an amphibious plane, a lighter plane, single engine. Every one of those planes were put out of commission. I don't think, I, I know that most of those old JRFs did not get burned completely. I don't, I suppose it was because the crews were right nearby with fire extinguishers and put them out, put the fire out if they caught on fire mm -hmm. because that was the same. Anyway, at the end of the day, all those big patrol planes had caught on fire. In the meantime, I went in and, of course, I went in and out of my army all during that battle and it was so machine guns and got other guns going to see anything that I could do as a chief petty officer to fight off the Japs. All these men that worked for me, they were, most of them, all there, they were a few of them were ashore on liberty <laughs> that were not there. But they were there, the whole squadron. Of all those three squadrons were down at the hangar area, practically all of them were right there fighting the Japs and when they could get a machine gun. See, was a, all of our machine guns were in the planes. And each plane had racks in the plane for spare magazines for the guns there, and guns in the bow right and left waist guns, they were 50 calibers. And once the plane got airborne, back aft and the bottom of the plane, you could take out a section of the hull and an outrigger mount, fold it out there, and that was another 30 caliber gun to protect the plane from being attacked from the rear and shooting it full of holes, bringing the plane down underneath rear attack. Oh, um, another thing that I did about the time that I ran through the armory the first time, I went right out and started shooting after a little while. Two or three times, you didn't hear an airplane. You didn't hear that airplane buzzing around the base making his attack. I went out there. About that time, this man Sullivan come 
trotting around the hangar and I immediately assigned him the job of taking those bomb handling trucks with the 500 pound TNT depth charges out of the hangar. Because if they'd ever got hit in those fuses and gone off, that would have always just blown the hangar all to pieces mm -hmm. and undoubtedly killed a lot of men around there. Well, that didn't happen. He, this man, is a comical thing. I gave him this job, taking those planes. All right, the first thing he had to do is go find a truck to haul those trucks. And each truck, Tom, that was ahead of Tom, so you could hook one bomb handling truck to the other. It was made a big ring there, and you could just hook that ring over a hook on the stern end. So you could haul four or five of them off. It didn't take any great power to load them, but when I come back in there, I could tell him just what to do. He told him, get those things out of here. And I said, whatever you do, don't put them in one place. We had what they called an Algarobi bush out there. Algarobi bushes, they were just a native shrubbery that grew up there. He says, where shall I take them, Chief? I said, take them out in the Algerobi bushes. Or whatever you do, don't put them all in one place. Spread them out, put one here and one there. I think there were four or five of those handling trucks with that stuff. When I come back in there, he hadn't moved them. And I was ready to kill him. <laughs> but I didn't know he'd gone off to find this truck. Oops. Okay, we're back. <laughs> okay, about that time, I saw a piece of young handling trucks had been moved. And quite a bit of time went on. What this guy had done, he went out to try to get a truck. And you could never find a truck. There's always somebody using it. So, so, no. Anyway. I decided right. to kill him. No, we, we <laughs> did most of the interviews there. All right. And then I, but I went out again and planted that gun and followed a few, shot at a few more Jap different planes. I can't tell you how many Japanese planes I shot at. And I can remember that I shot at every one that I could bear on. Do you know if you shot any down or? The thing of it is, you don't shoot an airplane basically out of the air with a light machine gun. Mm -hmm. Well, they can get even hit by 20 millimeter, 40 millimeter shot. And the aircraft guns mm -hmm. still fly on and do their duty, and maybe they come down, and maybe they don't. Of course, if the plane gets hit in a critical spot, say the engine, certain things like that, they certainly get shot down. Mm -hmm. I did not see a single plane go down, and that began to worry me. Because, in fact, I made a remark during the course of this battle. I made a remark. I said, "Oh Christ, we can't even seem to get one of them." <laughs> now I didn't know there was other planes. I didn't absolutely know it, but I knew there were other people uh -huh. down at the other hangars. We're shooting at that plane too. Uh -huh. But you didn't know that. You did you didn't know the words. Right there where I was, there were plenty of things happening to keep it busy. All right. Now the next time I went back in there, those bomb handling trucks with the depth charges on were gone. Well that made me feel so happy. Well I found out later. This guy went off to find the truck, and he had to find it. Somebody always was using the truck. Mm -hmm. Only one squadron, one truck. He finally found the truck, and by the time he got back to the hangar, personnel, and a lot of them, had closed the hangar doors. <laughs> and once you get those huge doors closed, he took everybody in the squadron to open them if he didn't have a truck. All right, he now had the truck, but he had to open the squadron doors. 
Then he got inside there, hooked a bomb hand and truck together, and took him off. Whatever happened to him, I couldn't tell you. He took him out of the hangar, and that was a big relief to me to see those things get out of the hangar, because if they'd ever, 500 pounds of TNT, is, well, we had 500 pound bombs, we had 1,000 pound bombs, and smaller bombs. But anyway, that was one thing that really shook me up when I found out the depth charges had not been removed from that hangar <laughs> right as soon as I expected them to. Now, were you injured at all during this? Oh, yes, all during this time. I picked up shrapnel every once in a while. Oh, the Japanese also not only had 7.7, which is about a 31 caliber machine gun. Our machine guns were 30 caliber, model 1906 called. All right? Mm -hmm. The Japanese had copies of the British Vickers gun, which was a slow firing gun compared to ours. That's the one thing I thought about. Why are the guns firing so slow? That was before I found out that the Japanese were attacking us. Okay, in that case there, they also had a 20 millimeter cannon in each of their wings outside the propeller. See, they had a three-bladed propeller. Mm -hmm. This is a Jap striker. Big, long propellers. They were powerful airplanes. When they came, when they come in there to fire, they would fire these 20 millimeter guns, and they were not synchronized. They were outside the field, swept with the propeller. Mm -hmm. They could just come in and make it, but they were very slow firing. I remember, I at first heard this pop, 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 about three or four of those sounds much louder and much slower than the 7.7 .7 machine guns. They were synchronized, mm -hmm. shot through the right. propellers. If they weren't synchronized, they'd shoot a hole through the propeller. And anyway, those cannons, when they hit a target or the ground or anything, they had a impact fuse and the case was a little over three inches long the projector the case was about the same they were i'd heard later they were a copy of a german or an austrian 20 millimeter cannon 20 millimeters just about three quarters of an inch mm -hmm. very near three quarters of four and when those things hit the shot would fly all over. And in my case there, I was just lucky as hell because a big piece of that shrapnel, they seemed to break longitudinally. Look, with a thin case, they weren't a great thick. Those pieces of shrapnel would fly all around and if they hit anybody within range of them, that made a wound. During that time, I'd picked up. I had 21 shrapnel hits, in me, and it wasn't my day to die. None of the big pieces hit me, but enough hit me to put me down and out. Next day at one o'clock, after that battle was all over, I went to the sick bay, and I thought. Was like a lot of guys, I thought she had to get that shrapnel out of here. I went to the sick bay to get the shrapnel to the doctor. Later on, I rented him a home in San Diego. It was a doctor Pope, and an old senior doctor. Just had two doctors there, and a corpsman or two, which are sailors, that are hospital men. He said, well, Chief, when I went there, I told him the doctor would come there to get some shrapnel taken out of me. And he put 
but the stethoscope school follow me. He said, Chief, I think those shrapnels have penetrated your chest cavity. And I knew damn well they had, because I could hear all kinds of blood gurgling around inside of me. <laughs> and I said, well, sir, I guess that's right. Turned to the corner, turned the chief in. And I was in the sick bay until the 24th of December. And it was about 1 o'clock or 12 o'clock on the morning of December the 8th, 1941. So the shrapnel hits that I took, and then once, once I got down, I, 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 it seems to me I just slept for two or three days because we worked all the rest of that day, all that night, mm -hmm. establishing gun pits and gun mounts. Actually went to our metal smiths. You know, each one has got all these different ratings. And our metal smiths, they made us 34 gun mounts that we had no gun mounts. The gun mounts are part of the plane and you can't take it out. And each plane had four machine guns and buku ammunition. Each airplane at its, each gun station had racks for spare magazines. So a lot of these things, machine guns, had been taken out of the plane. But if they weren't taken out right away, those machine guns burned and all the ammunition burned up right in the plane. We, now were all the hangars destroyed, all four of the hangars? No, no, they were not. Now that's another thing they claimed that all those hangars were burned down. They were all damaged, mm -hmm. and two of them caught on fire. And one of them, you could say it was destroyed, but a big, big steel structure, it don't burn up. The roofs mm -hmm. burn, and anything inflammable around that area, it mm -hmm. all got burned up. And the end is Okay, I'm just going to ask you a couple of questions just to end because I guess you have the dinner, your wife signaled we have the dinner to go to. Um, after Pearl Harbor, just they, could you tell me what ships you were assigned to during the remainder of the war? Uh -huh. Well, there's the thing. <laughs> I'm the only guy that got the big bronze medal who mm -hmm. was not over at Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. you, okay. And all over the sea, there were 15 medals of honor awarded for exploit and heroism on the island of Oahu on the 7th of December. Mm -hmm. There was also one awarded at Lake, mm -hmm. one at Midway, and one out in the Philippines. Made 18 medals of honor. And most of them were posthumous. Mm -hmm. The people, uh, say the commanding officer, the ships mm -hmm. over at Pearl, mm -hmm. they were granted. And the guys I remember got acquainted with all of them. One was Admiral Fuqua. He was damage control officer on the USS Arizona, which was sunk and destroyed. And he was a very busy man trying to, as part of the first lieutenant's job, to get the ship underway. You know, any time the ship gets underway, it takes a great crew of men to take a battleship. There's all kinds of men have to do a big job right. to get that battleship underway. Now, Could I, can I end with one question because yeah. you have to go. I know your wife is yeah, no. three minutes. Um, how do you think being a recipient of the Congressional Medal of Honor has changed your life? Uh, do you think it has changed your life in any way? Oh, absolutely. In what way? Well, well the main thing is the people you get to meet. How many sailors get to meet admirals and generals, mm -hmm. or, or marines? Any enlisted man in the Navy, he, he knows these senior officers, like Admiral Kimmel and Admiral Short. They were the two officers out there, the senior officers of Army and the Navy. Now, along with them, there's always a Marine Corps officer, but he is part of the Navy, and we had one old Marine Major, Major Donahue, he was in charge, the senior officer of our, we had about 100 Marines, 
with an old top sergeant and a couple of junior sergeants for the same way. Oh, so these, all of these uh, were taken. There were dozens of chief petty officers in each one of those squadrons. Mm -hmm. And the majority of the chiefs were aviation chief machinist mates with a couple of metalsmiths. And at one time they had aviation riggers. Then we also have enlisted pilots naval aviation pilots in the Navy. There was always 10 or 12 enlisted pilots. And the naval aviators are officers. Mm -hmm. right. All the way from the commanding officer, generally a lieutenant commander is the commanding officer of each 12 planes, patrol plane squadron, or fighter squadron, mm -hmm. torpedo squadron, scouting squadron, training squadrons. They've got so many of the different Okay, well, um, we're going to stop the interview now, okay? L let me just ask you one question. Who presented you with the Medal of Honor? That's one thing I'm proud of. Normally, I would have gone back to Washington and Franklin Delano Roosevelt would have put this medal on me. But Fleet Admiral Nimitz gave me mine right out in the war zone. I, I never was a great fan of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, after he decided to run for the third term, he left me. <laughs> but he was a good politician, and because he wasn't the worst president we ever had. But my medal of honor was presented to me about a year after the action. See, the medal of honor don't come quick. Uh -huh, right. It has to be thoroughly investigated. It's got to meet all kinds of criteria. It has to be right before okay. it's Okay, we just ran out of film. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Uh, you're welcome. Thank you, sir.